Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Hello, hello. My name is Jacob Smith. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I am here representing Altimetric Collider along with my colleague, Ryan Robinson, um, as well as uh, a few of our other Altimetric team members who I'll be introducing in just a moment. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, Altimetric, um, for those that uh, haven't joined us know. programs previously, if you haven't joined us for a program previously, uh, Altimetric is essentially a digital transformation company, which means that we work with uh, companies, helping them stay ahead of the curve with the ever-changing landscape of technology, um, sourcing innovation from within their teams and helping them uh, yeah, stay ahead of the curve. Um, a major piece of what we do uh, is what we're actually here discussing today. Um, so, uh, uh, chunk of our team is dedicated to big data and everything that relates to that, machine learning, AI, all that good stuff. Um, so today we are here talking about taming big data for decision-making. Um, the intention of this conversation is to kind of set a foundation and really kind of explore just the current landscape of what's going on um, in that area related to big data analysis, AI, all that good stuff. Um, so for folks, tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube or wherever you're tuning in from, uh, we highly encourage you be sure to subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel. Um, follow us on, on Meetup, uh, as well as other social media channels uh, at Collider Detroit on most of them um, <laughs> for more awesome content uh, like this. We intend to, moving forward, be hosting um, regular sessions about big data and, and all this kind of good stuff. Um, and you can see a video from uh, end of September uh, that we did just recently um, talking about data engineering in the real world, uh, covering some real world examples of, um, of, of how uh, these things work in practice. So without further ado, uh, this is we're, we're in the lunch slot here. So we've got limited, uh, limited time. So what I want to do is, is go ahead and introduce um, our presenters today. Uh, so we're joined by two uh, senior business analysts from the Altimetric team, Anthony Raj Martin, uh, as well as Rama Hamo. Um, they both work, they're full-time uh, data engineers on the Altimetric team, excuse me, uh, senior business analysts on the Altimetric team, working full-time at uh, one of our uh, big local clients, Ford Motor Company. Uh, they are both very experienced, very knowledgeable, um, and have a lot of exciting information to share. So without further ado, I want to hand it off to Anthony and Rama. Thank you, uh, Jake. All right, so hope you are able to see my screen. Um, again, in the interest of time, this is a little bit about me. Um, so again, I'm from India. Um, so I'm married to my wonderful wife, Sylvia, and I have two beautiful children, Hannah and Joshua. And um, uh, my, my um, educational qualification is like, I'm, uh, I did uh, my electronics engineering back in India, and I'm uh, just completed my postgraduate in artificial intelligence and machine learning from um, University of Texas, um, Austin campus. Um, and Rama, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Yeah, this is Rama Hamu. Uh, I'm originally from Middle East, Iraq, and uh, I have BSc in electrical and communication engineering, and I did a master's in engineering technology from Bowling Green State University. And currently I'm working on my MBA. I'm two classes away from finishing my MBA. And uh, I worked in IT in multiple like frameworks from front end back in development. And I have interest also in AI. And um, so that's very much about me. And this is uh, something I'm glad you know to present to you guys. Thank you. All right. So without further ado, um, so the goal of, or at least my goal for today is that like when you guys walk away uh, at the top of the hour um, today, um, I hope you would have a little bit more understanding and be able to appreciate of, of what machine learning or AI is, and as well have uh, a different understanding of what the data, right? And today we perceive data in, you know, in a different way. You know, I talk to many people and when I pose this question to them, like, you know, what does data mean to you? And I get almost different answers from every single one of them. So hopefully we'll have a better appreciation of what the data is. And uh, we'll also try to um, beat some of the myths when it comes to um, AI and um, 
machine learning um, with a with a use case that we are going to be presenting to you today, and which is very much relatable to the Motor City um, from where we are tuning in. So quickly jumping into the topic of data. So this is imagine this as our digital landscape, right? The digital universe. Um, and as we know, 2020 is not you know, the, the a normal year as we have experienced in the past. But in 2020, statistics says that we have 4.5 billion internet users, right? Just to put this in context, like this is all the nation in the world except India, China, and USA combined, right? So I think we have roughly over 233 or 35 some nations. Just imagine like the, the citizens of worldwide web, right? So if we can just um, bring in the citizen group and, and you know, we can pretty much change the face of it just by this 4.5 billion group of internet users. 3.5 billion Google search per day, right? So just imagine like if we do not have not anything else, just the searches, just the question that the, the uh, people are trying to ask in the world. If we just have the question, right, we could pretty much solve all the problem, right? We could in, do the next biggest in, uh, invention. We can understand what the world needs and what it needs now and, and, invent, uh, and come up with inventions from there. 95 million photos or videos are being curated or generated every single day. So if this was in the right hands of the people, just imagine right now we could solve a problem or an issue even before we as consumers would know that it's an issue, right? Because when we take an image or photograph of me, you know, of us, we are not just taking a photograph of our face, but also things surrounding us, right? So just by um, all the other um, data points that we could collect from the photographs, if it is channeled to the right source, we could solve so much problem in the world. Five million tweets per day. That, that blows my mind. Five million tweets. The reason why it blows my mind is like roughly half of the nations in the world has population of uh, 5 million or less, right? We, we could pretty much create a revolution in a country and change uh, the progress of the country, right? Either for good or bad, if, if this tool is used uh, correctly. 7.3 million Facebook photos being added per day. I see Facebook as like people for people, sort of, sort of, you know, Twitter. Um, but with the 7.3 million Facebook, uh, uh, you know, photos or, you know, the communication that is happening, you know, you know we do not need any big organization to, to help us. You know, we people can help each other uh, just by this one tool that we have, right? Of all, this is the thing that blows my mind, like 306 billion email per day. It's a class of confusion. I know I, I, I often get confused, like why are people are sending so many emails? I'm not so much a fan of email, but this is the truth. The, the fact, as of 2020, 306 billion email are, uh, uh, is being sent per day. So what does that mean? So in the digital universe, every single day, as of 2020, we are creating or 2,500 petabyte worth of data is being landed. And the interesting fact is, off of this 2,500 petabyte, 40% um, of it is being generated by machine. That is today in 2020. So if we jump onto our, our uh, now back to the future vehicle with 1.2 gigawatt capacitor and go to 2025, I'm going to hide my thing. Okay. 2025, the, the amount of data that is being landed in the digital universe is going to be increased. Again, this is only in next five years, is going to be increased to 463,000 petabyte worth of data, which is like roughly 180 fold compared to what we are seeing today. Okay. Um, this is a lot of data. I don't know. A petabyte is like um, almost like a thousand terabyte is what a petabyte is. So 463,000 petabyte worth of data will be landing in the digital universe every single day as of 2025. So what does it mean? Like just in the last two years, in the entire digital universe, you know, we created 90% worth of data compared to the entire history. 
Okay, just in the last two years, just just let it soak in your mind, and we will take this as a um, uh, you no know, a, a point to talk about closer to our um, at the top of the hour, right? But just think about it. Just in the last two years, we generated 90% of data compared to the entire um, uh, history. That's amazing. You know, that blows my mind altogether. So with that, we will jump into like, you know, why is this increase in data, right? For that, we need to have a fundamental understanding of what the data is, right? So this is data as we know, right? So we, have, we know the data is in, um, uh, in the tabular format, um, right? So it's in a, in a grid format with uh, rows and columns, and some might recognize this as data, like a financial status or data visualization tool, uh, financial analysis, all of this is data as well governmental uh, data, right, um, or bank records, or medical records, or the data that is being generated at the corporate. But some of you, I think, may also agree with me that now, uh, now that we have uh, all this digital media, right, you know, some, again, not all, um, because some of them are still not exposed to or have the understanding of seeing the video or, or image or a music as a data. Um, because to them, music is just music. This is not a conventional way of thinking, right? Um, at the end of the day, if you see the Abraham Lincoln, again, it's, um, the resolution is very low here, but I just wanted to bring it out that at the end of the day, image is nothing but uh, uh, like uh, a grid formatted data, which just has a bunch of, um, numbers which represents the pixel intensity of that particular area, right? So this is data, this is how I see when I see a picture. But do you think like, is this what is causing that, the, the increase in that, uh, the data that we are seeing um, in the digital universe? Um, I doubt, right? I This is contributing definitely, but this is not the sole reason why we are seeing a um, lot of data being led into, into the digital universe. So what I believe is like, if you look at all these images, right? So here, you now Uri taking up, you know, a photograph of him and someone taking a stroll in their vehicle, exercising, you know, reading a book uh, in, your, you know, in your tablet or watching a movie, right? Um, so when people see this, right, maybe you, you would, I'm sure you would agree with me that you know, here the context of data would be the, the photo itself that Udi is taking uh, in the, in, when it comes to the reading um, a novel in electronic media, it's just novel itself as a data or out here in this case, um, the movie as a data, right? But, but that is not the sole reason why we are seeing this in, in increase in data, right? Because each of these outlets, right? is continuously trying to understand like you as a user, how do you perceive this data that they are presenting? So my belief is that that is what is causing or creating this, this enormous amount of data being landed into the digital universe, right? So when you're watching a movie, um, you're not just watching a movie, right? Be, be, you are basically feeding the data to the Netflix that helps them profile you. They can understand you uh, better by, by by learning the type of genre of movie that you'd like to watch. Um, they, they, they are able to track like which movie are you skipping half the way, right? You, you, you are uh, quitting half the way. And the movies that you are like fast forwarding on watching, right? Basically they are using all of these to understand you. So that's an additional data that you, are gen that you, you as, as a person are generating unknowingly. Likewise, right, if you are, you know, most of us have a Fitbit, right? You know, we just, we, we constantly are generating a data with our heart rate, you know, pulse and whatnot. And if, if you take this example of a, a car, you're not just going, right? You are basically feeding in the, the GPS data because most of the vehicles that we are generating at this day and age has a, a modem in it. So with that, you are able to, you know, continue to feed in the data of where you are going, how fast you are going, how hard you are applying brake, you know. Um, so you're just generating so much data, right? So I want you to look at all this picture and, and just, you know, superficially it may seem like you know, you're just typing something, but underlying to it, right, that you are generating a lot more data that you do not realize. So the day when we started carrying this uh, smartphone device, I believe that's when 
we as human turned bionic and we started the journey of like you know funneling in the data so i feel like you know, the data is nothing but us as a human everything revolves around us every single organization wants to understand their customer and these some of this uh, electronic media that we have on us is constantly generating the data based on our our, our actions that we take so i believe this is what is causing this enormous amount of increase in the data that we see in the um, the digital universe. With that, right, so now that we have a little bit of understanding of what the data is, let's jump into, um, I know some of you want to understand, like, you know, the question that I saw was, like, what is data engineering versus data science, right? That's that's um, a question that, it, that are being asked. But why stop there, right? Why, why just stop uh, answering these two questions? How about, like, let's talk about all of it. If you go to LinkedIn and just start searching data, um, LinkedIn would recommend like so many other topics, right? I mean, we have data engineering, deep learning, data scientists, you know, data science, you know, what does all of these mean, right? So I'm going to take, you know, take all these different topics and basically going to group them into like four categories. And I call them as like the opportunities that the data present, the, the data that we just saw in the previous slide presents to us, right? And those opportunities are you know the, the area of study or the the opportunities that uh, align with the data acquisition and stewardship likewise um, data inference decision making and uh, pushing the boundaries um, with respect to data acquisition um, so this is uh, an area of study or um, an opportunity that presents to all of us where someone make sure that you know the organization has the continuous flow of data because data is the new money right it's a new oil so if you can understand your customer you are pretty much you know guaranteed to succeed in whatever you do so once you have the data i know you should be able to glean meaningful information out of it and you should be able to enrich the data basically to to enhance the quality of the data and also be able to tell a story out of the data it as well, you know, protect your data, protect your customer, right? So this is one area or field of study or the opportunity that presents to us. And the second is the data inference itself. Um, like once you have the data, um, how can you describe the data? How can you tell, like just based on looking at the historical data, how can you tell a story of what had happened, why it happened, and also able to project like what will happen like in the upcoming days, weeks, month, or year, and if we want to do a change of course, right? Like what can we do more like an A-B analysis of like, if we make this kind of a change, then it would impact us in a positive or negative way, right? So this is another area of study, which I call as data inference. And decision making is, is the glitterati of today, right? We need to, this is machine learning, artificial intelligence, where we are able to understand this complex data and be and you know historical data and able to provide the real time decision making as well like uncover complex patterns um, and recommend personalized um, uh, uh, products for the customers as well the last one is pushing the boundaries so this is where all our bright minds come and they they uncover new patterns they create new models they push the boundary of artificial intelligence and machine learning um, so these are the four different buckets that I could think of, but if you still are confused, like, you know, Anthony, I do not want to know all of this, right? Just on my face, just tell me like, what is data engineering and data science? So this is data engineering and all of these are data science. So with that, um, let's, let's move into the topic of today's topic of what is AI and why AI now, right? So artificial intelligence is a larger, it's a, it's a huge area of study within which machine learning is a portion of it and deep learning is another portion. So artificial intelligence is nothing but manifesting human intelligence to machine. Um, some of you can like easily relate to our autonomous vehicle where autonomous vehicle is now able to mimic that it's a driver and able to drive itself. But it's basically, uh, emitting the human intelligence, um, the vehicle is able to emit the human intelligence. And machine learning 
is empowering or enabling the computer to learn. It's just simply that. Um, it just want to see the historical data and want to understand it, learn the history. And based on its understanding of what the history, it's able to predict the future. Um, so deep learning, it's, it's the specialized, again, next generation of machine learning. That's how I see it. Again, deep learning can, can do much more complex uh, data pattern uh, learning compared to the machine learning. So in today's topic, we are going to focus on machine learning. Again, within machine learning, there are different areas of study, supervised, unsupervised learning, feature engineering, reinforcement learning, ensemble techniques. And under each of these categories, right? for, for example, in supervised learning, there are so many algorithms. Um, but for today, in the interest of time, we'll just focus on the supervised learning and one specific algorithm, um, you know, which we are going to be demoing it um, to the end of this uh, session. So with that, like why A, we saw what AI is. So let's talk about why A, why now, right? Um, there has been a lot of hype around AI in the past, you know, four or five years. So does it mean that AI came into existence only in the last four or five years? No, it's not the case. The first machine learning algorithm was developed in 1950s. But then like 70 years later, like why did it take like 70 years long for, for people to recognize and appreciate AI, right? So for that, I want to take a simple example of matrix multiplication, right? I'm sure many of you know how this works. You just take, you know, a three by two and two by three and multiply these numbers uh, to each of it. And then some uh, like three by, you know, sum of three cross three, four cross eight, five cross six becomes 71. So if you feed this matrix multiplication, a simple matrix multiplication to your computer, which has um, a, a CPU in it, right? Uh, at the end of the day, this is broken into smaller unit where it's that's like addition and multiplication and each of it is considered as one unit, right? It takes time, right? It, it has to like first multiply it and then sum it and then it has to go to the next um, uh, in a row and column, do the same thing. Again, it would just repeat itself until we have the data. So it's done serially. And it takes time. And um, one of our, you know, artificial intelligence algorithm, which is VGG16, um, it has like 138 million such parameters per image. So if you want to train our VGG16 model to be able to predict something, right? We we let's assume like we are funneling in like one uh, 100,000 images. So 100,000 multiplied by 138 million parameters is what it has to do to learn. Uh, to be able to predict, uh, to come up with a, with a model, basically. So with the, with, the, with the CPUs that we have, as I said, it's a complex code, but has a single thread performance. It takes like you know, first in, first out, uh, first out. So I see this as like a Ferrari, right? If you want to go to New York with your girlfriend, now go with a Ferrari, right? But Ferrari is not a good good vehicle if you want to go to the same New York or to a state park with your entire family. Right? You, you don't want to make like 10 different tips uh, to pick up and drop each and every single member of your family, right? For that case, you might need to choose to go in a minivan, right? So the GPU is the latest advancement, which is like uh, hundreds and even thousands of complex cores, which can do concurrent processing, parallel processing, which a CPU cannot. So with the advancement in GPU, right? we are now able to implement some of the uh, artificial uh, intelligence or machine learning algorithm, which we otherwise couldn't do with CPU. So this is what is causing the advancement on, in, uh, in AI. This is one reason. And the other reason is in fact, like because we are, we are generating a lot more data than we did in the history. So that's another piece to the puzzle. So because of this technological advancement with GPU and the data that we are seeing, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, interest around machine learning and artificial intelligence at this day and age. Just to give you guys an understanding, like a few years ago, Google uh, built this supercomputer to do uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence of a problem. So they built their own machine like with 1,000 CPUs uh, with 16,000 cores, which costed them $5 billion. And um, they they ran their algorithm and it took them a week for the algorithm to execute. Um, 
And fast forward a few years later, Stanford did the same thing. They used the same data set, but they were able to do the same thing with the help of GPU within $33,000. So just imagine the price difference, the, the GPU um, price difference, right? From, from $5 billion, which would have otherwise cost if we had used the CPU, now we are able to do the same processing with the $33,000. So this is the power of GPU, which is what is now promoting all organizations, big and small, to to able to explore in this territory. So with that, we'll jump into. So now that uh, you know, we can understand what the difference between machine learning and the AI is. Let's just talk about and and under, and uh, have an understanding of like why AI and why now. Let's jump into the machine learning itself, right? So I told you like a couple of slides ago, machine learning is nothing but enabling the machine to learn, but learn what, right? This is the key. We want to enable the machine to learn about the world through the lens of the data, right? And uh, the data is nothing but a representation of the history, right? So once something gets created, right? The example, the, the, the session that we are recording now at the top of the hour, once we are done with our recording, it's a historical data, right? It's a history, it's not a current data. So, so the data that the, we are exposing to the machine learning model is, is, a, is a point in history, right? We are just throwing a speckle at it and we are telling the algorithm or the model to learn the data. And we are making an assumption here, right? That the history will repeat itself. That's a big assumption that we are making. Like if this had happened in the past, like if between December and Jan uh, in and March, if it snows in Michigan, then it's going to snow this year as well, right? That's that's an assumption that we are making that the history will repeat itself. So this is something that you might need to understand, right? That would be caveat, right? Um, like the COVID time, right? So we are not forcing it, and history did not repeat itself in this year, in which case the model will fail. Right, so this is an assumption that we keep in mind while building the model. So what is this history has, right? History has two pieces of information in it. One is the actual key information itself, and the second thing is noise. So the, the task of this machine learning is the ability or the art to learn the information from the history, historical data and suppress the noise as much as possible. And based on this information, right, we know that history will, or we are, our assumption is that history will repeat itself. So if we can, if we can just somehow extract the information out of noise, then we can pretty much learn out of this information and we can guarantee that this information will repeat itself. But the noise may not necessarily repeat itself, right? Um, so that is something that the machine learning does, which we, uh, our human also will not be able to do. So the key for the machine learning is the ability to extract the information from the data. That is one. And the ability to create the mathematical model, right? So if we expose this machine learning uh, with like thousands of data points and hundreds or hundreds and thousands of um, uh, you know, data samples. And we want it to summarize in the mathematical model to, to describe what the machine learning algorithm sees the data as, right? It, 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 the machine learns and able to uh, summarize the data using the mathematical model. Not just that, and the ability to continue to evolve and learn um, as it is being exposed to more and more information, right? So this is what machine learning is, right? So machine learning is, you know, enabling the machine to learn through the lens of the data. So with that, we'll jump into like the three different um, uh, field of study within machine learning, which is one is supervised learning, the second is unsupervised, and the third one is the reinforcement learning. So supervised learning is when, like, you know, we have this bunch of field, age, gender, smoke, and obese, obesity, and with that, we want to be able to predict, like, you know, will this person has, has this, is this data point, um, will this data point contribute to a high risk in, in like, I don't know, heart attack, or low risk or medium risk, right? So here we have set up inputs, and uh, we want to predict something. So we would give this information to the model, and the model will train on this data. And when we want to predict something, that right, we can feed in a new data point with this, like with, with this data point of uh, a male of 60 years of old who is not a smoker and not an obese category, then we want the, the model to, to tell us like, you know, this person 
uh, as a low or no risk of uh, heart diseases, right? So this is supervised learning. So, and the problem specifically here I'm talking about here is like classification, right? We have three different classes, right? Will, that, will a person um, is high risk of heart disease or medium risk or low risk? So this is called classification problem. So if, let's say, the, let's take a similar example of, of uh, weather pattern, right? If you want to understand like how the temperature is going to be today. So the temperature is, is a continuous series of number, right? It could range anywhere from like negative 100 to a, to a positive 110. Um, and we want to predict like a, a, a continuous number here. So that is called as a regression problem, right? Where we are not just classifying um, whether it's going to rain or not, rather we are just saying like, you know, if it rains, how much amount will it rain? Will it be one inch or five inch or 25 inch, right? That's what we are trying to predict with the regression problem. Unsupervised learning is where we do not have a target. You know, we have been just thrown up with a bunch of data where, and we want to just understand the data, right? Um, so here our goal is like, we just want to understand the cluster of people, like the red ones are could be like in a high risk, the oranges are like medium risk and the blue ones are like low risk, you know, just going by this example. We're just trying to understand the clusters um, and dimensionality re reduction. So when we have so much data, like how do we clean and only take the most important piece of information that would help us to, to learn more about the world, right? So that technique, it's called dim you know, dimensionality rejection. And the final thing is association rule, um, where like if, if a customer, like, again, this is very widely used in um, in all the retail industry. Um, so if you go to the grocery store, there is a why, reason why you see like bread and milk and the egg are you know, close proximity to each other, right? So they, so with the association rule, um, with this logic um, or, or algorithm, um, the retail industry is able to understand like, you know, what is the likelihood of a customer buying an egg given they all had already bought bread and milk. Accordingly, they would shelf the product closer to each other. Um, the, the final topic is reinforcement learning, right? So again, classic uh, example that might exist, uh, excite you all is the autonomous driving. But in this case, um, uh, we can also call it as like semi-supervised learning, right? The goal is for this vehicle to, to drive like a human does, but there is no specific, you know, uh, task that we want it to do, right? Because if, if applying a brake or inc uh, increasing the accelerator or turning on the uh, blinkers or all of those are like a separate task to the, to the vehicle. So we cannot, group that as a supervised learning. Neither can we not group it as a unsupervised learning because we want it to do certain actions. So uh, the easier to understand example is like, you know, like training your dog, right? A dog cannot understand our language, but it can understand the sound. So when we want the dog to sit, right? And if it is able to sit, then we give the dog a treat, a reward. And then the dog would know, like, you know, if I hear this sound and if I obey that sound, then I might get a reward. So it would be interested in doing that again and again. If a dog is not following the instruction, then the dog might get some sort of a punishment or may not get the reward. The same concept is applied here. Um, so when the agent, which is the model, um, in an environment, in this case, an autonomous vehicle, when it's uh, doing certain actions, which is uh, which is the right thing for the for the agent to do, then it will get a reward. That way it will it will um, basically be increasing, biasing towards that action. If we do not want the vehicle to up, you know both apply the you know put the you know apply both gas and brake at the same time, then that's a negative reward, right? You, so that's um, a, a loss value that we would be sending into the to the model. That way the model will try to not to repeat that again because it's not getting its reward. So that's reinforcement learning. Um, so with that, um, we'll see like one of the models, supervised learning te technique, um, which we will also demonstrate um, at the end of this call. Uh, it's a support vector machine. I will, I'll try to not to jump into the mathematics behind it, um, uh, but the idea is like, you know, we have a bunch of data, positive and negative, let's say they are, these are two different call classification, like in you know, a high risk or low risk of heart disease. The, the goal of this algorithm is to linearly, or for that matter, for the goal of any machine learning classifying algorithm is to linearly separate the data so that it's able to predict 
given a set of inputs, right? So when you see here, you know, there, there are multiple ways you can linearly uh, separate these two data. So the task of this uh, SVM classifier is to identify like which linear separation is the best um, linear separation for the algorithm to predict, right? So with that, um, so what it does is uh, underlying, so it will try to identify like these two points, uh, this positive and the negative data point. So the margin between these data groups, right, whichever is the highest, like basically this is a road, right? So the width of the road, if we, whichever um, separable, uh, separatable line, right? So this is the, uh, the linear the separable line. And if, if this line creates a maximum margin between these two data groups, then it would um, take, the support vector machine would take this as a best linearly separable line. But in the real world, we are not going to get the data like this, right? So it's going to be in some cases, you know, a data might cross over, right? And then you might see a negative sample here, a positive sample here. In that case, the goal is like, you know, increasing the margin is also means, you know, it also means like, um, let me see, all right not working anyway so increasing the margin is is all is also you can derive it as like uh you know reducing the inverse of margin right uh, like basically one by margin and you want to reduce that basically you want to reduce the loss so that would be the goal of the machine learning algorithm but what if we get a data like this so this is more like a real world scenario where you have a bunch of positive and negative samples and there's no way to linearly separate the data. So that's when what we do is like, you know, let, you know, let me take about, uh, talk about another example here. Like forget about the two dimensional, let's take one dimensional data and we have a bunch of data points here. How do you be able to linearly separate this data point? Like if you draw a line here, you still have a bunch of, you know, orange and green points here. So you're unable to linearly separate. If you do another here, but there is no way you just can linearly separate this, this data in this one dimensional, right? So that's when if you, you what if we introduce like a, a function here and create the single dimensional data to a higher dimension, like from one dimension to a two dimension. Like basically, you know, how about we take the distance between this the zero and for each of the point and make it as a second dimension along with this value of x. Right, where this function to find the distance between the zero and this point is like a nonlinear function. So if you do that, you would see an image like this. Like basically zero is here, and if you want to measure a distance, anything on the other side which has a negative axis, uh, you would see like a parabola. And the positive axis is as well, you will see a parabola that is going this side, right? And now you are able to linearly separate the data. And so this is what we call as like kernel or the functions that you would usually apply to data such as this to be able to linearly separate the data. Um, so with that, we will jump onto the use case, right? And this is the algorithm we are we are going to be using today um, to to present this use case. So Rama, with that, you know, if you want to um, take the ball over, please. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, or, or I can control, I can control the deck, and you can just keep talking. Oh, uh, I have it also already here. So, okay, that's fine. So you can just uh, control, it, Anthony. So the use Sorry. case I will uh, present today, which is false identification in three-phase induction motors using supports vectors machine. So as uh, Anthony mentioned, supports vectors machine. It's an AI technique that's very good for classification, actually. And uh, one thing I actually just want to mention before going into the case uh, study. So basically, you know, like AI techniques, it can be used in any scale. You know, it's not like something can be used only at NASA or Apple or, you know, for GM. It can be used in any scale, you know. And nowadays, it's very, very simple. Like uh, this case study was done uh, back in school, like uh, in 2013 in Bowling Green State University. So nowadays, you know, with Google Collab, this can be done very, very easily with just like small Python program. There's uh, like function, it will does everything for us nowadays. So 
So the false identification three-phase induction motor. First thing I want to talk like why three-phase induction motor. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Anthony? Yeah. So you know, three-phase induction motor is one of the like most popular like motors used in the industry, and it's used like in different scales, you know, in like small scales and also larger scales. So basically, this induction motor it can expose you know to different types of faults. And the thing is, you know, we need, so it needs to be monitored like all the time because in the big industries, like it's like millions of dollars, right? So this motor, it has to be monitored all the time. And then in case of any fault or any fault it's happening, we need, we need to use, you know, some relay system, which is there are different types like electromagnetic relays and also microprocessor based relays, you know, so it can just, like cut the circle and save the motor. Also, it's the safety of the workers, right? If anything happened to the motor. So to do that, we used supports vectors machine like uh, as an AI technique. And uh, we trained the machine first with different types of external faults. And then after that, we connected to the system and we were able to, in case of any fault is happening, machine already learned and it was stopping the motor, you know, and saving the motor. So the faults that we used was different types of faults, uh, like uh, overloading, for example, which is this one, of course, when there is more load like uh, applied to the motor than its rating. And also single facing, you know, in a three phase induction motor, like the single facing can be done, uh, like if we, if we just disconnect any of the faces. And we had also the lock rotor. So as you guys know, like in any three phase induction motor, right? Like it's a, there is a stator and rotor. So if the if there if there is lack in rotor, if there is extra torque applied or anything, so it, it's also it can cause the motor to blow. And we have a ground fault, which is just you know just like one of the faces you can just touch the ground. And we have under voltage, like in the motor, you know we when we apply the uh, the voltage, if we apply voltage to be less than its full rating, that's what uh, the motor also. <laughs> you know, to an, uh, like an exposed condition or an error condition. And over voltage, which is basically the opposite of under voltage. And we have the unbalanced supply. When the three phases that we are supplying voltage to the motor, it's unbalanced. You know, it can be unbalanced current or voltage also. Yeah. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so basically this is the complete system that we have. As you guys see, we have the three phase induction motor and uh, was uh, connected uh, to this computer like CPU, which we have, uh, which we have the SVM trained already, you know? And uh, we had the relay system here, which is, was microprocessor based relays. And it was like working, you know, like, uh, so in case if any of this error occurs, we were able to stop the motor and it was a successful like project. Yeah, next slide, uh, yes. So this is, as uh, I mentioned, like this is types of faults that we have like single facing unbalanced voltage, you know, this is number of patterns that we have. We have also the no fault here. And this is uh, like, if, as you guys see, you know, the three phase uh, uh, induction motor, like the stator and rotor and uh, like how we supply, you know, the voltage. So, and it was uh, Delta transform at that time. So after we applied it, uh, for the SVM, uh, we used some software, which we call it LibSVM. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Dan? Yes. So the LibSVM, which is, uh, it was a package already, uh, ready, you know, and developed at uh, Taiwan uh, Department of Computer Science in the National Taiwan University, which is, it works, you know, I mean, it's a free online. If you guys also interest, I can provide more information about that. And it works also on Windows, uh, Linux, or any system that we have operating system. So basically, we trained the machine. We used like a big sample of data to train the machine. And then we tested with other data that we have. So with providing, as you guys see here, like uh, we have different types, for example, of um, gamma and uh, C. And also we use the radial basis function, which is to train the model, you know. And uh, like the trained model was 788 patterns in three phase and the testing done by 21 samples. That was the initial testing 
till we were able to get the 100 percentage, then we connected to the real time to the motor and it was able to identify all the faults. Yeah, can you just go to the next one? Yeah, so as you guys see here, we have different types of kernel functions. For example, linear functions, polynomial, radial basis, and sigmoid. And there is math also behind this uh, functions. And uh, another thing also was done, which is was a has very big impact, you know, was the scaling factor. So basically, if we provide like the data, you know, the three, we had like three, three phase, so it was three uh, voltages and three currents, six inputs. If we did not scale it, you know, and we tried with the scaling, which we had a very big difference actually between these two. And beside that also, we have the T and gamma, which is uh, parameters used in the kernel functions. So we were able to get when we have like between minus one to zero, the scaling factor, and it wasn't that we were able to get 100 percentage classification, like uh, which is, that was very like, you know, very high result actually at that time. Yeah, uh, can you go to the next one? So the last slide. Um, no oh, okay. Okay, uh, so uh, another thing I wanted to talk about that, you know, like uh, we also had a comparison between artificial neural network system and the supports vectors machine with the same data, same grid, same, uh, same situations with the same types of faults. And for classification for supports vectors machine, we were able to get like much better results, you know, like the highest one that we were able to get in artificial neural network was um, 98 uh, something and uh, another point also you know for for example supports vectors machine it's a very efficient technique which is basically you know it can be trained with less time you know and less effort you know and uh, especially nowadays you know with this google collab and this uh, python programs we can do it very easily but in artificial neural networks there is like many concentrates and the connection between the networks and the hidden layers so this was more effective actually for the uh, three-phase induction, like for, for the classification of the external faults. And uh, actually at that time when we did this one in 2013, like to the best of our knowledge was the first time implemented in the world, like a supports vectors machine for identifying the external faults of three-phase induction motors. Right. Yeah. And if I may add a couple of things, right? So there, there was... Yes. <clears throat> The specific reason why we chose, like we we need to bring this use case um, to to basically you know expose a couple of myths, right? Which I think Rama already touched upon. Sure. Machine learning and artificial does not necessarily have to be done only by big industries, right? Even a small or medium scale industry, which is operating with few motors and all, like you know, with a simple setup like this, right? They would be able to control their um, you know their motors. And, and that's what we wanted to demonstrate, right? It's not out of reach nowadays um, for for you know big industries, right? At your home, like with your with your gaming laptop, right? All you need is like a, a laptop with good um, uh, uh, video card, right? Um, and if you have a gaming laptop, you already have with uh, the information with a good GPU power, you can pretty much build your artificial intelligence model and connect it to like a, a, a motor or maybe a camera to be able to make uh, decisions for you, right? So you, the only thing that you need is though like the data points to, to train your model. So that's where you have to spend time and curate the data for the model to learn enough about the world, right? So you cannot just, um, you know, if you want the, you know, example, if you want the machine learning to predict cancer among the patients, then you cannot just feed all the patients that are the data of the patients who have diagnosed as cancer, then the model would be biased in predicting everybody as like uh, patients who, who have cancer. So you have to expose the model with enough data variation, enough combination of data with with, with um, patient data who bo who have been both diagnosed as, diagnosed as cancer patient versus otherwise, right? You have to curate so much data and then feed that into it then your model will be able to perform. So the 90% of work in the machine learning or for that matter in artificial intelligence as well is like to prepare your data, enrich your data, and identify the data points that you want to pass into your model, right? That's 90% of the work. 10% of the work is building the actual model. 
Yeah, actually, um, uh, just to add to your point, uh, actually, that's a very uh, good point. So can you just go to the slide that we have the data? Yes. So if you guys see here for the no fault, we used 154 patterns here and the rest will be just for faults because the assumption is, you know, like the motor will work like most of the time, you know, in a very normal cons like uh, uh, conditions, right? So if any time, you know, there is an like abnormal condition, we, we need to identify that. So basically, you know, we need also to be careful when we are like using like, uh, you know, using this data, type of data, number of patterns, all these factors actually affects the training model. And the accuracy will, is, will increase, you know, as long, you know, we have like better training and we have more patterns, you know, provided to the machine. So, yeah. so just to chime in quickly. So as we, uh, as we get close to uh, time here, I just want to make sure that we leave a few minutes for, for questions as well. I don't want to cut you guys off though. Yeah, we can jump into q and Cool. So if, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, what books or other resources would you recommend for someone looking to, to take a deeper dive and learn more about machine learning? All right. So um, if you go to YouTube uh, and type machine learning Stanford or machine learning MIT, they have published the entire code structure in YouTube. So with that, you can pretty much get, you know, learn the entire machine learning and, and become an expert just by going to YouTube. And there are a bunch of books um, which uh, you know, I have, again, most of these are being uh, curated by, you know, A enthusiast. So, um, so wow. again, this is a very much, this is a field where people are still exploring, still uh, are trying to learn better and, and coming up with a better and better model. So to, I would say like to understand the basic concepts of machine learning and all, the good place to start would be like YouTube. I would say like a machine learning Stanford uh, course or um, MIT course start with that. Um, and then I would um, suggest you to like to go to Kaggle and uh, there is where, you know, you would find like bunch of real world data to practice um, your machine learning skills. Um, so with these, Two things. I, I I think you know you can become an expert. From that point on, uh, like other blogs, uh, like um, uh, Vidya Analytics, I think, and, uh, and there are different blogs for um, um, like Medium and and whatnot, right? So those blog people are like constantly you know curating different materials. So that would be another good read as well. Yes, for sure. So I personally follow uh, the uh, Google Collab, which is very effective, you know, and I have shared the link. And beside that, also the Kaggle, as uh, Anthony mentioned, that's also a very good resource, you know. Great. And then one more question here. So uh, Emil's wondering, are there any detrimental applications to ML? If so, is there any level of supervision or monitoring with these applications? I don't know if you're if you're referring to like um, runaway AI or, or or what exactly, but curious what you we all think about that. Yeah. So yeah, um, if, if you're if, you, if the question is about like you know the ethical artificial intelligence, like where, where do we draw the boundary? Is that the question? Like, do we want AI to just take over the world? Like, is the question around that? Emil, hey, do you have any? Uh... Clarity on, on your question there? Like, I know there's like a, a sort of rumor of code that is able to sort of write itself. And I guess what I'm trying to ask, like, is there like a level of automation that is sort of detrimental to us? And if so, is there any like regulation for that level of automation? Right. Um, I, I do not think there is any regulation as of now, but um, so I, I think I, I see A as like a, a potential opportunity. I, I, I do not feel like it would replace us eventually. Um, example, when computer came in, right, people thought like computer is going to take over the world, but the ground truth is like, you know, it, it, the opportunity as we know today is just different compared to what we have done in the past. Um, so I feel like you know AI would present us a different um, sort of opportunity 
but when it comes to uh, ethical AI, that I do agree, right? You know, you can, you know, for example, you can use your phone, your smartphone, for good causes, or you can use your smartphone to cause some bad damage, right? Take take uh, some inappropriate photos of somebody and, and ruin their life. So at the end of the day, like it comes to like ethical of 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 artificial intelligence, right? So I do not think there is any regulation around it. Um, you know, if, if it gets into a bad hand, you know, can people cause some harm? I think so. If you know, people could do it, um, but uh, as long as and as far as I know, most of the people that I follow at least are using it for um, for good causes. So only time will tell, like you know, if, um, like when it when it comes to the regulation, right? Um, so, but as of now, I, I as, as now at least I could recollect of, I do not think that there is any regulation around AI. And that is one of the things I believe uh, Elon Musk is trying to push real hard in the capital, like to to get some regulation around it. Um, with Google's you know, deep AI, you know, you can go to YouTube and watch his, uh, one of his podcasts. He was very troubled with it, like not having a regulation around AI, but yeah, that's, again, we, as far as I can recollect, we do not have any regulations. So actually, I just want to add to Anthony's point, you know, like the regulation, it will be just on the data, right? Because now if you see like our data is everywhere, right? And even like Facebook, they track us like on the phone, wherever we go. So the question is, how much is too much, you know? Is this amount of data or this amount of privacy that everybody has, you know, is this enough or no? I, I think that's a big debate, actually, even like in Congress, they talked about that, you know, with the, like Mark Zuckerberg. So there are more... It's, it's the ethical part it comes with the data i think it will be more than you know the ai part very interesting well just in the interest of time um if you all can stick around for a couple more minutes we might be able to sneak in one more question but i want to uh, make sure that i have a chance to thank uh rama and anthony for this extremely insightful conversation uh, as vj mentioned in the chat here uh, it's a lot of information to cover in an hour, and clearly there is an opportunity to continue uh, diving deeper, which we certainly intend to do. Uh, the uh, plan here is to be hosting regular sessions, uh, diving into data engineering, big data, um, and all of these different topics. Um, don't forget to follow us on Meetup um, to see updates about upcoming events. Uh, YouTube to see past event recordings um, and all other social networks, uh, Collider Detroit. Um, we appreciate you all joining. Definitely do not be a stranger. We'd love to see you again soon. Um, we do, uh, for those who aren't already members, we also have a Collider uh, Slack channel where you can ask questions as well. And yeah, definitely encourage everybody to connect and uh, keep throwing out great suggestions. With that, let's uh, hope everybody has an awesome rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.